Well, I think it is important that if you're going to be the recipient of someone's thoughts, to have some idea at the content from which they speak. Uh, so what I'm going to do is give you some of my thinking today <clears throat> on Christian counseling and psychology that I think you need to know, number one, that I speak as a clinician who has worked with a large number and variety of human beings for now, Lori, the past 48 years. <laughs> so I, uh, all those human beings have come to me because something is broken. And we have worked together in a very personal and focused way in a closed room behind a door for a short period of time. It has led to a very rich and intensive study of people. I have heard about the contents of many, many human minds and hearts. And I wanna give you some thoughts about this work as I have gone through it. First, in order to do this work, I believe that you and I as caregivers need an understanding of who God is. It is foundational to working with his creatures. He's the one who thought humans up. We are all created in his image. If I am to work with one of his created beings, not to mention be one myself, I must know him. John Calvin said that without knowledge of God, there's no knowledge of self. And without knowledge of self, there's no knowledge of God. A growing awareness of God as he is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ results in a greater understanding of who you and I are and those and who we are meant to be according to God's design. It also teaches us about who God is because Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In other words, that which teaches us about which is broken, is whole. The whole person, Jesus, teaches us human beings who are broken about wholeness. That which is shattered also teaches us about what is whole. <clears throat> Every component contributes to our understanding. This is critical for a clinician, both in terms of intellectual knowledge and also experiential relating knowledge. If I do not understand who God is, how am I to help one of his creatures? Knowing him means that his word, both written and made flesh in Jesus Christ, are very important. Knowing also means living before him, me, in love and obedience to him. I truly believe that counseling is not truly Christian unless the knowledge of God is worked out in the life of the individual therapist. This work is not just about information, as important as that may be. It is about becoming like the one that we study, which is Christ. Second, we need to understand who humans are. And this must be grounded in the study of God himself, for he is their designer. He made us and he named us. He knows what is in us far beyond our own capacity to understand ourselves. What does it mean to be a cre create, creature, creature created by God? And what does it mean for that creature to be sinful? What has sin done to that creature created by God? What does it mean to be in the image of God himself? How are we like him? How are we not like him at all? And if something is in the image of something else, it must by definition be capable of bearing an image. It must by its very nature be malleable, shapeable, capable of reflecting and therefore vulnerable. You can stand in front of the trunk of a tree until you're 120 and you will not see your image reflected there. Put yourself on the edge of a pond and you will see yourself staring back. To have been created in the image of something is to be 
in your own nature an image bearer. That's a very important thing for me to understand as a clinician, because if the people I see are image bearers and therefore malleable, what happens when children, the most malleable of all humans, are repeatedly faced and marinated with evil? Obviously, the impact on them will not be superficial. And indeed, it is not. Trauma is not a superficial wound. It is a personhood wound. It silences, isolates, and renders the person helpless. We have been created in the image of a God who speaks, who relates to us, and who has power. Trauma is the destruction of who God meant us to be. The scriptures are the thoughts and words of our God. They contain the voice of God to us. The worlds were made by his voice, a voice that has continued to speak throughout time, a voice that longs to speak to you and to me. God is forever speaking himself into his creation. He is by nature perpetually articulate. He is the God who reveals himself. Trauma silences voice. A second part of the image of God in us is relationship. When God speaks about creating man, he says, let us make man in our image. Relationship is part of who God is. Jesus speaks about being with God before time. Jesus is God with us. Humans are created in relationship both to God himself and to another. Jesus illustrates for us the perfect relationship in his relationship as son with the father. There are two components to that relationship that are important in our understanding of persons as clinicians. First, Jesus knew the father and was known by the father. So we have reciprocal knowledge. Jesus, secondly, loved the father and was loved by the Father. And so we have reciprocal love. Relationship as it was intended includes both a reciprocal knowing and a reciprocal loving. This helps me to understand the shattering of things like sexual abuse or violence on a life so that I do not minimize the damage. In the beginning, God, our creator, called us to rule and subdue his earth, not each other, not human ruling and subduing human, but humans ruling and subduing his earth. He gave us power as to use as influence, to use to regulate, to create, and to govern things in his world. We were meant to bear the image of God in our flesh and together bear the image in our flesh and leave an impact of that image, his image, on this created world. We were not intended as humans to be invisible, ineffective, damaging, or helpless. Trauma and abuse shatter God-given power. Third, you and I need a solid understanding of evil, of sin, and suffering. These are the forces that damage us both within and without. There are two errors we as Christians often fall into. One is to dismiss or diminish the suffering we encounter in others. So we fail to grasp the damage, for example, of a 10-year-old girl's rape. We do not honor God or her when we see such damage is erased because someone just said, I'm sorry, you have to say you forgive and that'll fix everything. We reduce this human that God made when we do that. As if her fear and her endless nightmares and her confusion about the lies that the rape told her about herself and God can be erased by a few simple words. They cannot. In doing so, we distort and diminish the horrible evil she has suffered. We misrepresent our God and we minimize the soul sickness of the one who raped her. God hates evil. 
He tells us that very clearly. He hates the damage that it does to his precious lambs. As Christians, we should be those who understand the grave and long-lasting destruction such things do to God's lambs. Our God never minimizes such suffering. Can our God work redemptively in those places? Absolutely, he can. For those who care for others in his names, I often call the work that I do a front row seat to redemption. But it is first a front row seat to devastation. And we're called to speak the truth about both of those things and understand the deep damage caused to vulnerable image bearers by others. The cross on which Jesus bore both the evil and the damage demonstrates how great that damage is. I fear sometimes we want to minimize it because it makes us feel better. If we grasp what scripture teaches about evil and deception, we will approach our work of caregiving and counseling with great humility, with soul searching, with repentance, and a hunger for the wisdom and love of God. We tend to speak on evil as an out there sort of thing. You know, it's unusual, it's extreme, it's foreign, it's over someplace else. If, however, we are to represent Christ in our caregiving, we must generously maintain God's point of view. God says evil is not just something we do, it is something we humans are. Sin is not merely wrong doing, it is wrong being. It is how we think, it is what we desire, it is how we are uh, motivated, Scripture tells us that every intent of the thoughts of the heart are only evil continuing, continuously. That's a remarkable assessment of you and of me. Jesus quotes Isaiah saying that people's hearts are far away from him. He says in Mark 7, that which comes out of us is that which defiles us. And he lists a great many evils. And then he says they all proceed from within humans. God would not tell a 10-year-old that the abuse she experienced was her fault. It has come out of the abuser onto and into her. And then there is suffering. Those of us who do clinical work see clients whose lives are riddled with suffering. It has debilitated them. It shrinks human beings. We scour the scriptures and discover that the answer to why is not there. We do learn that suffering is. We learn from the scriptures that health of any kind is never certain, that maintain, maintaining it is often not under my control or yours, and that disease, suffering, and pain can rise up out of a human life from nowhere and completely alter that life. Contrary to the beliefs of many of our various cultures, health is not worthy of our worship, or it is a tentative, changeable, and fragile God. We also learn that suffering seems unreasonable, irrational, and unjust. How many times have you encountered suffering in someone's life or your own and thought it was fair? Suffering really makes sense. And I often think that the ability to most easily explain suffering is the clearest indicator of never having suffered. Jesus taught that it could not be balanced out. He and the disciples were walking along and they passed a man blind from birth who was begging by the road. And the disciples said to Jesus, who sinned? This man or his parents? Whose fault is it? So the disciples said to Jesus, what's the answer, A or B? And Jesus said, C. Which is very like him. You can rarely balance it out. There is no balance in the gang rape of a, of a child. There is no fairness in the suffering of a baby with cancer. There is no justice in the rape of a missionary nurse who worked endlessly in an isolated station in the service of others. You cannot make suffering fair. 
The scriptures also teach that suffering in and of itself is not good. That seems obvious, doesn't it? Death is not good. Violence is not good. Cruelty is not good. These things are wrong and were not intended to be. However, I am sure you have encountered those who try and say suffering is good. We sit across from indescribable suffering and we glibly say, all things work together for good to those who love God. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that verse with all my heart, but it is not a glib verse. And it does not say that suffering is good. It does say, do not worry about what you are enduring because it will all turn out nice in the, in the end. Those are not the promises of that verse. What it does say to us is that the God we worship is capable of redeeming the deepest agony, the most hideous suffering, the pain that is beyond words into something that gives life and brings glory to him. That is what it says. But make no mistake, that transfiguring of agony cost Jesus Christ inestimably. Death does not transform into life easily or without great, great cost. It did not do so in the life of Jesus, nor will it do so in yours or mine. Without a clear understanding of God, personhood, evil, and suffering, our counseling can easily become glib, three steps to something superficial, naive, prescriptive, and frankly, full of deception because we're failing to really face things as they are. We not only misrepresent our God in these ways, we do damage to his lambs. I fear we often do these things because we are weary of carrying the suffering of others, which is an easy place to come to. The fourth area of needed study is a Christian view of health. That is based ultimately on the knowledge and understanding of the personality of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. We have in a study of Christ a rich picture of a whole and healthy person who suffered. We have a study of man as he was meant to be in this world. My study of the human beings who enter my office must be informed by my study of the person of the Son of Man. We will not understand health and wholeness from the standpoint of disease, but rather the reverse. It is only as we begin to comprehend what wholeness really looks like that we can recognize disease. I only understand that a one-legged man is crippled because of my knowledge that men were meant to have two legs. If I'd never seen a man with two legs, I would not know that a one-legged man was crippled. It just is. The more I understand the function of two legs and the broad range of activities and experiences that a two-legged man can enter into, the more I comprehend the limitation of having only one leg. One purpose of a theory about persons is to discern what is healthy and what is pathological. It follows that we need a model of health from which to judge. Do we really suppose we can derive such a model from fallen creatures? Can we derive such a model from looking at ourselves? What is to prevent us from presenting a healthy something that is merely a particular version of broken that appeals to us or matches our own experience? We don't really know what true health looks like. An in-depth study of the person of Christ as he moved through this world dispels many of the conclusions about health that humans have put forth. For example, we have said, suffering is always the person's fault or negative emotions are always wrong. Emotions like anger or grief, or if you do the right thing, it will turn out right. Such statements are lies and we know they are lies because they were not true in the life of Jesus. As an understanding of the person of the Son of Man teaches us how to live in this world and how to help others live. We come to understand facets of what it means to be human. 
we can more clearly see where things are wrong, damaged, destructive to the self and others. As we more and more grasp how the son of man conducted himself as a human being. We can better understand what health looks like and we'll find that many of our prior judgments of health and right and good have not been determined by the word of God, written in flesh, but rather by our culture, our teachings, our affinities and our preferences or creeds. Conformity to Christ the image of God in man produces holiness, humility, righteousness. Those become our standard as measured by him, not success, not happiness, not approval by the majority. Our picture of what it means to be human in this world will be enriched and radically altered as we look like the one whose name we bear. And finally, our Christian faith must inform not only our thinking and theorizing, but our practice as well. It should shape the therapeutic relationship. It should transform the person of the therapist. God, who is our creator, gave us as humans work. The call of God to serve is a call to growing likeness to Christ. We are told by Jesus himself that our call can be summed up in this way. Love God with everything you are and have and love others as you love yourself. These, we are told, override all else. That means they are to govern our thinking. They are to govern our judgments. They are to govern the therapeutic relationship. Love of God as the primary value means there's something that therapists must do and be before engaging in the work of loving others, whether it's in a family, at a job, or in a relationship therapeutically. Often the work of therapy is seen as being about knowledge, <clears throat> and it is. It is seen as being about techniques and interventions, and it is. It is seen about getting good outcomes, and it is. But if you and I are to do those things as Christians, then the first work of therapy, the first and foremost, is about the therapist loving God. According to the scriptures, love and obedience to God in an individual's life are inseparable. We say we love God, but look nothing like him. The scriptures say we have deceived ourselves when we do that. This means that my love and obedience to God in my private and professional life matters in a central way. For the Christian, love of God and obedience in life is the undergirding, overriding, eternal value of all values. You think about it. Say you're working with a family in crisis, perhaps because of sexual abuse in the family, or you're working with a church in crisis because a pastor has embezzled money, or a woman who's coming out of sex trafficking. I can tell you for certain that knowledge and techniques are needed and empathy is critical. And empirical research on therapy outcomes will shed light for you. But in those places, we also need wisdom, discernment, self-control, great love, patience, and steadfastness. Where do those come from? Graduate school? Books? They come from a character that is slowly, over the years, being molded into Christ-likeness. That's the source. He himself is all those things we need. Life and healing in the therapy will come as a therapist who is full of his life, picks up the tools of knowledge, empathy, relationship, techniques, and research. The bedrock value for the counselor is love and obedience to Christ, out of which flows love for others. 
Those foundational values mean I will treat others with compassion because he did, respect because he did, understanding because he did, and patience because he did. Those values mean that I can say that child sexual abuse and embezzlement of funds and sex trafficking are not all right. And they do very deep damage to human beings. I would be betraying love of God and love of other to say anything less. He does not minimize such things. He not, does not try to make them sound less than they are. In the work of therapy, the character of the counselor matters. The hidden personal life matters if we believe the word of God. According to that word, God is the source of all life. He is, in fact, life itself. If we are to bring that life into the therapeutic relationship, then he must dwell in us. And we must live before him. So as to be full of his life running over and out. <laughs> Do we really think our skills and interventions can heal broken hearts? Can bring repentance? can reshape traumatized lives in a transformative way. Our values are not to be determined by the hurts, needs, or desires of the person with whom we are working, nor are they to be determined by my preferences, my standards, my patience, or my comfort. We are to be rooted in the character of God himself. We are to bring his fragrance, a taste of him, into the room. I hold to the value of life or fidelity or purity because they are found in God, who is the source of all good. And he has called you and me personally to those qualities as well. It is my work as a therapist to maintain my relationship with Jesus Christ so that it is one of love and obedience. God works both sides of the equation with great equanimity, I have found. He opens blind eyes. He restores the years the locusts have eaten in lives. He sets prisoners free and he awakens the dead. And while he is doing that work in my office, in my client, I find he is also working in me, teaching me wisdom, love, truth, discernment, mercy, and patience which is Christ-likeness. He is calling me to bow to that work in others' lives to let him form his character in me. The work of therapy, if we let it, is redemptive for both sides. He is, in essence, teaching me to love him and to love others as he would. Both client and therapist are going to school together. Some years ago, I recognized that therapy is a humble work, not a grand work. Sounds great, you know, graduate school and degrees and all those things. It's not grand. It's a servant's job. It is a work that must faithfully represent the character of the wonderful counselor. The human tasks are important, of course, and necessary, but they must be done in a way that represents the master well or else they will not bring life into dark places. Therapy is about listening. It's about empathy. It's about skills. And we need to know how to listen and listen well. We need to enter into the experience of others and find out what it's like to be them. We need to apply our skills and continually be learning new ones. Our skills take us into death and dying. They take us into grief and torment and irrationality and paralysis. We have to listen to horror and empathize with things we find inconceivable. No one told us our work was a servant's work. I don't think they would have got many of us to go to graduate school if they would told us that. But that is what it is. The paradox in all of this is that doing a servant's work has turned out to be a great honor the greatest, I think, because you see, to be a servant is to be like our master. There is no greater honor than that. 
he sometimes calls me to be a servant in very difficult places. Places I don't want to go. He sometimes calls me to be a servant in the way that I bristle. No, thank you. He calls me to people who are very difficult to serve. They can be demanding, complaining, rejecting, entitled, and entrenched. Listening and empathizing and intervening effectively can be repetitive and often carries very small rewards. But I am constantly reminded that it is enough for the servant to be like her master. It is sufficient. God has chosen that in the work of healing, instrumentality is to be used. This is certainly true in the medical realm. That's also true in the therapeutic. I must confess, I started out the work of therapy with an unholy alliance on the instruments. On the other hand, there are others who say that the instruments are not important. I believe they are wrong. We must do what we know with, the, with excellence. We cheat our clients if we do not offer them the best that there is. Our tools should be ready and sharpened, but we must not forget that such things are merely the instrument, no more. Healing does not reside in the instrument used. Healing comes from the person and the work of Christ and from him alone. Many decades ago, a pastor's wife brought a woman to see me. She knew she was a very troubled woman and did not understand why and could not get the woman to speak. She just shook. I was in my 20s. I had a master's degree and I was working on my PhD. Trauma was not yet even a recognized diagnostic category. I greeted her and I took her back to my office. She wanted me to go in first, so I did. We sat down and I said some things and I asked some questions. And she curled up in a fetal position on the chair and said nothing. Deep silence. I tried all sorts of things to get her to speak. Nothing happened. She kept curled up on the chair, looked down, and her whole body shook. After a few weeks of silent meetings, I quit talking. I did not know what to do or say. She came faithfully and we sat in silence. This went on for some months, about five, I think. I wondered out loud if I could ask her a few questions and would she just nod yes or no for them? And she finally nodded yes. So I said, I think you are afraid, yes? Yes. Of everybody? Yes. Did you ever know somebody you were not afraid of? I got my first no. It was six months before she opened her mouth and said a full sentence. She was my teacher. I often speak of her. I learned later that it was the first time in her life that she had sat with a human being in a closed room and been safe. When she first came home from the hospital, and she was in a crib, her father walked over and put his cigarettes out on her heels because she was not a boy. She was never safe. She stayed with me because she longed for that safety and she just wanted to be silent because she was afraid if she spoke, she would ruin it. She assumed I would get angry and tell her to talk or leave. It's only by God's grace I didn't. I'm a word person. <laughs> I didn't know what to do and struggled with thinking it was something I wasn't doing right. I chose to let her be my teacher about her life and how she needed me to respond. And nothing had ever prepared me for such an encounter. Again, I learned about the cigarettes on the heels uh, just because she was a girl. She was beaten mercilessly. She was forbidden to eat at the dinner table. The father fed her in a bowl with his dogs. He raged at her as far back as she could recall. 
he brought friends, friends into the house so that they could use her the same way he would. And then he would throw her down in the basement in the dark. He trafficked her for years. Trafficking was not even a word back then. He would drop her off on a farm at the beginning of the summer and pick her up when school was ready to start and watch as the money was counted into his hands. All of my work over these decades bears the fruit of her courage. It bears the fruit of her speaking the truth of her life to me, her teaching me things I did not even know to imagine. I don't think my professors or supervisors did either. Her life changed, though it was always scarred. My life changed tremendously. She is in heaven now and has seen the one who bore her scars, both eternal and external. But her lessons remain. Her life taught me things that have touched every human victim I have ever met. Her, the fruit is hers. My fruit is hers. Her lessons are embedded in what I will teach this week. She used God to teach me, to change me, and to impact many others. Our work is small, your work and mine, and yet expansive. It is slow and yet somehow miraculous at times. Our work is limited and yet reaches far beyond our little offices. Our work touches evil and is redemptive. It is life inspiring for others, for sure, but also for you and for me. While we do our work, our little human work, God is doing his, not just for the one sitting across from us, but in us as well. Thank you.